All right, everybody. Well, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for sticking through what I know has been a long, albeit interesting day. And now we're going to discuss an issue that I think does not get nearly enough play here in Washington or in the discussion more broadly, either here or in the region, and that's the environmental issues in the South China Sea. So joining us today, uh, we have Professor John McManus, who is a professor of marine biology and fisheries uh, and the director of the National Center for Coral Research at the University of Miami. Uh, professor Edgardo Gomez, a university professor emeritus and national scientist at the Marine Science Institute at the University of the Philippines. To my left, uh, Dr. Kwang Sao Shao, who is a research fellow and executive officer in the Biodiversity Research Center at Academica, uh, Academica Sinica in Taiwan. And Dr. Dan Liu, uh, associate researcher at the Center for Polar and Deep Ocean Development at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, each of them is going to discuss different aspects of environmental issues in the South China Sea, but I think they should play off each other quite nicely, and it's a great way to, I think, wrap up this discussion uh, with something that, frankly, we probably should have done at each of the last five South China Sea conferences. So without uh, further ado, why don't we start with Professor McManus. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'll just point out for uh, three of us are actually marine ecologists, and marine ecologists feel like we have to convince you with pictures and slides. So we, we, we're going to rely on these pictures. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, I also, um, I, I was mentioning before that most of the talk in this conference has been about uh, politics and legal aspects and and military and so forth. But if you ask about 100 million people who live around the coastlines of the South China Sea, what they worry about is not really even shipping and it's not oil, it's fisheries. And that's why the countries have the support that they have. It's about fisheries. So let's take a look at some of the issues uh, with the environment. Uh, <clears throat> these are uh, typical atolls. You look at the first one on the upper right, and that's what you see on Google Earth, what you're looking at is a, is a coral reef atoll, which has to do with a uh, coral reef growing around a ridge which sank. And the reason you only, it looks like a bunch of pearls is because most of that reef was not able to keep up with relative sea level rise in that area. So that submerged area is 30 to 60 feet. That's what most coral reefs are gonna look like, but the ones that are damaged are gonna look like that decades earlier than many other coral reefs. So we're worried about keeping coral reefs healthy just so they can keep up with sea level. And one of the picture on the right there is, uh, is uh, South Johnson Reef, which is one of those little pearls from the edge. And the very northern part is in the next picture and it fades into um, the, the coral structures. So there's a lot of coral on those subsurface uh, coral reefs. Then we have, just to show you, we have, it's an atoll that has a coral island. This one happens to be Taiping. Many of them are like that. Some of them are vegetated, some of them are not. And then my favorite reef, which is Scarborough Reef, it has all of these lines to the middle. I've been out there and I tell you, it's, it's one of the most beautiful reefs in the world. Those, all of those stripes are ridges of coral uh, that have big polyps, so it's like you're going through a, a garden with lots and lots of flowers on either side, and it's only a half day travel from Luzon. So the tourist value of this would be enormous, but I am quite frightened by the discussions that maybe both China and the Philippines ought to be able to get in there and fish as much as they can. Um, <clears throat> if you look at a coral reef, you approach from the outside, you see coral on the four reef slope, and then you get a crest that's taking all of the wave energy. Behind that, you get back reef and flat, which in many places is mostly sand or seagrass, but in the Spratly Islands, it's mostly coral. And then you get the lagoon, which also has a lot of coral. These pictures are from my recent trip to Thitu Island, which is Pagasa, which by the way means hope in the Philippines. And those are from the reef flat. So that's what we should be seeing. And most of the damage has been done in reef flats. You see uh, fast growing branching coral, a uh, little platy coral. Those grow really quickly because this place gets hit by typhoons and every few years it grows back. The large massive there, um, 
uh, that one, the, the tissue can break off, but it can, be, uh, it can replace itself. It'll resheat from the outside. So again, it recovers quickly. And when you hear about a rock in the Spratly Islands, it's either sand or, or gra uh, uh, coral gravel islands, some with vegetation, some without. But many of them are actually big versions of this genus, Parites, that were thrown up during tsunamis thousands of years ago. And they actually look like big rocks. Now this is the uh, kind of dredging that was going on for uh, building the islands, and that's a huge uh, dredging boat with, uh, these are running three and a half to four or five meters depth. And there you see one in operation there just as Subi Reef is beginning, and you see it's digging with that. That thing on the front is, a, is a, like a disco ball with teeth, and it rotates and it grinds up coral and substrate. So if you don't have enough sand, it's gonna make its own gravel and pull that up, and then uh, once you get that started, they, the Chinese government built uh, concrete walls and just filled it in. And that's quite important because one of the comments we've been getting is that um, China has been simulating the natural island building process. Actually, they're simulating the way I built a sandbox one time. You <laughs> just put a wall and pour sand. It has nothing to do with the natural reef uh, island building process which in most cases takes thousands of years. Uh, this is what uh, we've recently discovered since January, actually. Uh, this was pretty much unknown outside of China, uh, but the, the boats that were gathering giant clams were actually swinging them back and forth. And you see there's a giant clam that was left behind. That's my foot. Uh, <laughs> it's my foot, uh, the fin is 15 inches, so that's pretty big. That's kind of, uh, one of hundreds of products that were being made and sold around the world from the giant clam. Uh, it was carved up. In D, you see the, uh, the reef I was looking at, and it's all sort of bleeding sand. That's because that was when this was going on. And there on the right, you see a picture I took of that reef. And for a, a whole kilometer I swam, I didn't see a single living invertebrate uh, until I found one sea urchin, and then I swam a long time before I saw the next one. Uh, so it kills basically everything. The sand that gives life to the reef, when it's in the water, it can kill almost anything. And that's true whether you're digging it up for giant clams or dredging. This is uh, Fiery Cross Reef. At the left, it's almost natural condition, except it had the little uh, Chinese base on stilts. Uh, the, the one in the middle uh, is after it was clammed away, and so all of the ones where there are islands, it was clammed away uh, before they built the island. So when they say, well, we only built on dead coral, yes, <laughs> they only built on dead coral because a year or two before it had all been killed in giant clam gathering. And then the island, and you see all the silt leaking. But then we also have overfishing problems. And that's ultimately the big problem. And you cannot have a unilateral declaration of a fisheries regulation because everybody else thinks, oh, if I go along with it, I'm recognizing that nation's sovereignty. So they're actually, every time you have a unilateral declaration, it adds to the problem because the other countries feel obligated to violate it. So the only way we can stop this nonsense is to have tight coordination and come up with regulations the way they do in the North Sea and the Mediterranean. And then uh, this is the uh, total situation. I'm probably running over, so I won't go into great detail. This will be in the paper. But uh, you can see, I just, <clears throat> just to show you that outside of the Chinese uh, uh, issues, uh, the, the, the China accounts for about 98% of the uh, damage to these reefs, and it is substantial. Uh, right now, um, about 9% of the very shallow reefs of the Spratly Islands have been severely damaged, and so that's about 9% less chance that the fish larvae are going to be able to replace the overfished populations uh, uh, around the, the uh, South China Sea. So this is what we proposed in 92, 94 recently. Um, it, partly because of books like the one by Bill Hayton, which I highly recommend. Uh, he's looking for solutions, and there aren't a lot around there. And so suddenly, um, this idea has come back to life. Uh, but uh, it would look like the Antarctic Treaty, which has been fairly successful 
for, for many decades now, you have a freeze on claims in the treaty, a freeze on claims supportive activities. In other words, no more nonsense. You just agreed. We're just going to agree to disagree. Nobody loses anything, and nothing you do during the treaty period can ever be used in support of your claim. And that stops 90% of the problem. And then you have joint resource management team put together. You can call it a peace park. You can just call it a management agreement. I don't care what you call it. But if you don't do this, we are headed towards a major, major fisheries collapse in the part of the world where our fisheries collapse will lead to massive starvation and talk about military instability and all of that that's going to go with it. It's about the fisheries. Thank you. All right. John, I think you got the first uh, unprompted applause of the day. That says something. <laughs> I will throw it to Professor Gomez. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, um, so my, my talk sort of uh, builds up or relates to John's presentation. Um, let me see. Okay, here's the title of my uh, uh, short presentation. I uh, hope that uh, the, the paper uh, will be published um, relatively soon so you can read the, the whole of it. Um, this builds up on an earlier paper, uh, sort of a short article I, I wrote for the Philippine Daily Inquirer in the Philippines. And so I uh, sort of updated all of that. Now, uh, I thought I'd start with this um, um, uh, picture, uh, rather, uh, this set of maps to highlight the importance of the South China Sea. It is part of that part of the world that is the most species, most diverse in the world. This is the Coral Triangle. So uh, as you can see from the upper um, uh, part of uh, upper map, uh, there are 76% of the world's uh, coral species are found in the, in the Coral Triangle. And um, uh, in the South China Sea, there are some 571. Um, now, on the bottom part, you have uh, the, the reef uh, fisheries, and uh, we have more than one-third of, of the reef fisheries of the world in the Coral Triangle. So it's a very uh, specious, diverse part of the world, and I call it the marine paradise. And this is the, the part of the world that's now being uh, heavily impacted by, sorry, um, by um, uh, all of the activities that John has, has, uh, has um, described. Actually, the, the, the table on the left is an earlier uh, part, subpart of uh, what uh, uh, John just showed us. I only concentrated on the areas that had been covered over permanently, you know, uh, buried, cemented over. And, uh, and it, uh, for the whole South China Sea, there's some 14 uh, square kilometers. And um, of, of that, well, as John has pointed out, uh, more than 95% has been done by one country, and the other uh, four or five countries have um, uh, contributed a little bit to, to the, to the um, uh, rest. All right, and now, uh, what's the big deal here? Um, you know, in 1997, I think it was, uh, Robert Costanza uh, published a landmark paper on natural capital and what natural ecosystems are worth to mankind. And then uh, uh, his, one of his um, co-authors, uh, uh, Rudolf de Groot, uh, continued the studies. And they uh, came up with estimates as to what is the natural capital, what is the value of the ecosystem services that coral reefs provide. And uh, this table shows you that uh, uh, the coral reefs are the most valuable natural ecosystems on this planet, more valuable than terrestrial ecosystems uh, tropical, temperate uh, rainforests, uh, agricultural lands, or what have you. It is the coral reefs that are the most valuable natural ecosystems in the world. And these have been the ecosystems that have been targeted by recent activities in the South China Sea. Now, if you uh, do a little bit of multiplication of uh, $352,000 per hectare per year, multiply that by the area, of uh, what has been um, covered, covered over, only the areas permanently covered over in the South China Sea, that's half a billion dollars per, per, uh, for the whole uh, South China Sea. Okay. 
that's per, on a per year basis. Now, if you uh, 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 add to this uh, arithmetic what John pointed out, all of the airs that had been damaged with the dredging and everything, you multiply that by 10, and you're talking about $5 billion of ecosystem services that the area is losing every year. That's not a one-time thing, but it's every year. Now, um, I don't have a slide here, but uh, in my paper, I indicated that you know, um, some countries do um, care about coral reefs. And um, last year, there was a, or a couple of years, a few years ago, there was a US um, a minesweeper that got grounded on one of our reefs in the Philippines, the uh, USS Guardian. And we sort of uh, sued the United States. Well, they were good enough to pay us uh, one and a half million for only a, f a fraction of a hectare of coral reef that was damaged. Now, I don't know if anybody's going to pay us for mischief reef. Well, okay, this is just, uh, just an illustration. Uh, some, some pictures of beautiful uh, corals. All right, uh, the other thing is, uh, John was mentioned about the giant clams. Uh, this is just an area map of the distribution of giant clams in the world. And if you see sort of towards the middle there, and a little bit to the left is the South China Sea. And there are half a dozen species of giant clams in the world. Uh, that are within that area. And uh, the distribution area, excuse, excuse me, uh, I think I'm doing this wrong. Um, all right, well, uh, of um, the clams, there's, uh, the South China Sea represents the um, sort of uh, a significant portion of the distribution of seven, six species of giant clams in the world. And all of these, all of the living clams plus the shells have all been virtually wiped out of the of the South China Sea. And mind you, the giant clams are endangered species. They are both in the red list of IUCN, and they're in all in CITES. Okay. Now, in contrast to what has been happening of late, I just thought I'd, I'd show this. In the Philippines, what we were doing, trying to do over the past two, three decades, was to put back to restock giant clams, not only in the metropolitan waters of the Philippines, but also in its Pratlis. Uh, the, the map there shows you that there's two sort of uh, colored uh, spots on the left side of the map. The upper part is the, is the Scarborough Shoal, uh, and the, the, the lower uh, uh, dot there is uh, T2 Island, uh, what we call Pagasa or uh, Calayan Islands. And what you see on the left side is uh, our live giant clams that we put on, on a small boat to, before we deploy them back onto the reef. Uh, up on the upper right is where we have our giant clam mariculture facility in Bolinao, where we have literally tens of thousands of live giant clams, and that's the source of our restocking material. So we had started this process of putting them back in the West Philippine Sea, and now they've all been wiped out. Well, in the Philippines, of course, they're still there. All right, and this is what happens to them. And, uh, John mentioned about the, the dredging and so on. And you see up on the upper left, uh, 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 picture a uh, ship full of uh, giant clam shells uh, over on the right uh, some extra sh well, shells that are waiting to be carved in uh, Tanmen Island on the left is an example of a carved clam shell and uh, on the right uh, bottom right is, uh, is one of the shops there's hundreds hundreds of those shops in Tanmen Island on Hainan I mean Tanmen town or city in, in, on Hainan Island during the winter months, the seasonal surface well, circulation I just I'd, is dominated I'd, I'd show by this an to show the connectivity encompassing the whole basin of the South China Sea water uh, passing waters, through the KIG. Uh, therefore, to the, to the ends areas up in the eastern of, and of northeastern the part countries. of the South China Sea. While during the summer months, the seasonal surface circulation is dominated by a two-gyre system an anti-clockwise gyre on the northern region and a clockwise gyre on the southern region. The two gyres meet just north of the Kaleahan Island Group. Water passing through the KIG, therefore, ends up in the southeastern, eastern, and northeastern part of the basin. Uh, the connectivity of the South China Sea is very, very important for the Coral Triangle. There have been studies that have proven that it's vital to the diversity of the coral triangle. Uh, this is, I think, my semi-final slide. Uh, this is a, uh, an ongoing study where we are trying to track 
what is happening to the fishing effort or the fishing vessels in the South China Sea. Uh, I, I'd just like you to uh, focus on the upper right uh, corner of, of the, the series of maps. In 2013, it was clear. 2014, you see some red spots. And by 2015, you have a lot of red spots. These are Chinese fishing vessels that are moving from the west to the east. And they're actually fishing in the northern Philippines. This is the Babuyan Islands, just west of the Bashi Channel between Taiwan and, and, and Luzon. So this is, this is what is happening there now. You have more and more fishing vessels that are going eastwards and are taking over uh, fishing grounds that belong to the Philippines. And uh, we heard this morning, much of that is the Philippines EEZ. And for anybody to fish there, they have to get our permission. But what has been happening is that they've been preventing our fishers from doing their legitimate uh, occupations. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gomez. Um, <clears throat> next we have Dr. Xiao. How to get to the, yeah. okay. <clears throat> Uh, it is my uh, great uh, honor to have this opportunity uh, to give you a short talk on the current status of marine biodiversity and their threats in the South China Sea, especially in the Sprati Islands. As, and also I, I will mention about the policy that the, uh, my government currently adopted. As to my own viewpoint, and uh, probably shared with many ecologists, that the, uh, I think the best and the, the natural solution to solve this South China Sea issue is to accept South China Sea as a marine protected area in the future. Most of you might know that the uh, government of Taiwan occupied the uh, two largest islands in South China Sea since the government retreated uh, to Taiwan from the mainland China in 1949 till now. The first one is the Dongsa Atoll, we call the Pratas Island in the north. And uh, which has been established as a national marine park in the 2007. Another island is the Taiping Island, we call it, or call it the Ituaba, the largest natural island among the 113 named landforms and we, with the plants. The reason that I think I was invited here probably is because I helped the Taiwanese government to carry out the two projects on the island recently in the 2009 and the and 2014 uh, separately. The first project is the feasibility study for establishing Taiping Island as a national park. In the, in the conclusion of this report, we recommend the government to uh, set, set up the no-take area or the wildlife sanctuary, marine park, or even the marine peace park. But however, the authority has yet to approve one, in order to avoid any possible protest. The uh, second project was launched in 2014 to do the biodiversity study of Taiping Island. In this project, we published a book, an uh, HD DVD, which could be accessed online. I brought some copy here and the left uh, downstairs. If you have interest, you can pick that up. If they run away, you can email me and I can send you a copy no, without problem. The, although the Taiping Island has not been established as a marine protected area, but actually a no-take zone strictly uh, protected by the Coast Guard. No fishing or diving activity are allowed in the waters surrounding the island. So the marine ecological environment or seascape is really very beautiful and pristine as you could see some of our underwater photos here. Although the duration of the two expedition in the two projects uh, were very short, only two to four days each time, but our team uh, already recorded almost 1,000 species, including 360 species of fish. So our short survey could prove that the marine biodiversity is very high in South China Sea in Spratly. However, the marine environment in South China Sea is facing serious problem and, uh, and, and the damage and destruction mainly come from the overfishing and the illegal fishing as well as the 
reclamination of dredging and filling, which uh, uh, McMaster has already mentioned. This slide shows you from the uh, year of the, uh, 2011 to 2016, Taiwan Coastal Guard expelled 775 foreign fishing vessels from restricted waters around the island. These boats come from mainland China, Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia. They use the explosives and the poisons methods to catch fish. The uh, problem was even more serious in Pratas Island, simply because the atoll was much closer to the mainland. One recent example show you here at Pratas Island in the, this March of 20, this year, a 300 tons fishing boat with 41 fishermen on the boat was caught by the all Coast Guard. The boat had illegally harvested 1.5 tons of different corals, 400 kilograms of shellfish, and three green turtle, etc. Although Taiwan controlled the Taiping Island, the largest island in disputed flood list, the government policy is to build the island as uh, an ecological, peaceful, and low carbon island as our first priority. I think that's the reason why the former president, Ma ying announced that the South China Sea Peace Initiative in last July. He called on all the claimants to temporarily share up their disagreement to enable negotiation on sharing resources and the mutual exploitation. However, most scholars, especially ecologists and NGO, hope the next step will be established the island as a marine protected area to uh, pr uh, prioritize the conservation as, as the first priority. Because uh, for the economic and uh, human consideration, if the six claimed the country could manage the reef and the island, they occupied as a no-take or mar marine protected area, using Pratas Island, island and the Taiping Island as an example, then it can relieve the tension of military conflicts among disputed countries, save the high cost and isolation of military outposts on many of the islands, and protect and utilize sustainably the natural resources of South China Sea, creating a win-win solution. However, Taiwan's situation is somewhat awkward and difficult because Taiwan is not recognized by the UN and has no official diplomatic relationship with most countries. As a result, it cannot employ official channel to initiate mutual exploitation and of this idea. Moreover, Taiwan cannot collaborate with the mainland China on this issue. In doing so, Taiwan will be going against other uh, South China Sea countries and the United States and it will, it will lost its independence and identity. Therefore, the best things we could do is to transform Taiping Island into the low carbon island. For example, we, use, we have the solar power electricity system there. Uh, they can provide 16% of the island's energy, display, uh, displacing uh, 32,000 liters of the diesel fuel last year. The solar energy also can provide electricity to a five-bed hospital, which admit people of any nationality if needed about 10 times per year. To enhance international academic research collaboration is another way, good way, just like the uh, Antarctic Treaty to set up the dispute aside and promote research collaboration and sharing the data. Dongsa is one good example because the Ministry of Science and Technology, Taiwan has established one Dongsa at all international research station in the 2013. We welcome all the foreign scientists that could study there. The station will provide accommodation, laboratory instrument and diving gears for the field work. So the last one is my conclusion and the recommendation is that the Spratly is located inside on the border or the borderline of the Coral Triangle, uh, which uh, the Gomez just mentioned. So that the, uh, so to establish Spratly as the MPA uh, and promote international collaboration in academic research, data sharing and a probable ecotourism are the best strategy, not only to restore the re decline fishery resources and the marine biodiversity in the South China Sea, but also to let South China Sea to be peaceful and used sustainably in the future. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Schell. Uh, and last we have Dr. Leo. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, first of all, I would like to send my sincere gratitude for CSIS because uh, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to present here um, in the last panel as the last person. And unfortunately, I'm not a marine ecologist like the others. So that's why you see here, I'm the only one who will not use the slides, the PPT. <laughs> um, well, here my presentation is actually focused on the South China Sea arbitration and connection with the, uh, some of those issues with the ecological, with environmental, marine environmental protection. Um, well, my presentation actually would try to separate into several sections. For example, uh, first it would be talk a little bit about the submissions presented by the Philippines. And the second would be uh, talk a little bit about the construction and the development projects in those maritime features in the South China Sea. And the, for, uh, the third one would be environmental protection, marine environmental protection province. And if we still have time, I may talk a little bit about the uh, flows actually contained in the expert uh, reports and evidence in the South China Sea and, of course, the conclusion. Beginning from those submissions submitted by the Philippines in the South China Sea arbitration case, actually there are altogether 15. For one to two, it's about historical right and the U-shaped line. And assume uh, third till seven submission, it's about the maritime features in the, in the spotted islands, and, of course, one is Scarborough Pichel. And the in last submission, the last group of submission from eight, some, uh, number eight, till the last one is focused on the actual, the island construction and the uh, those facilities on the maritime features, and of course, maritime environment protection. And in terms of the um, a verdict this morning at around the five o'clock. I have to get up and also to download the verdict and I figure out that seems like the scenario behind the Philippines and China are very different. The Philippines methodology is more focused on, for example, it is the coastal state of the South China Sea, while China is seems to be not qualified as a coastal state in terms of law. And the second one is that um, all of the maritime features of Spotly are not islands. Therefore, they can only be entitled to either rocks or low tide elevations or artificial islands. And third is only the Philippines are entitled to those exclusive right to construct artificial islands in a spot island. Within its, it is so-called the EEZ and continental shelf, and China has no such right because it's not the coastal state. And the last way is the Philippines has exclusive right to, uh, to appropriate uh, low tide elevations, etc. But for China, as it has been explained in numerous events in its press release of the government and, of course, the news media, it seems like the China would like to explain that all of this uh, essence of the arbitration is more focused on the sovereignty issue. And in case it's not a sovereignty issue, then probably it shall goes to the limitation issue. However, the uh, word last year, it, it, it turns out that Chinese uh, claims were not supported by the PCA. Even uh, by the PCA uh, established the, 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 the uh, tribunal. But it seems like it turns out the verdict this morning seems to again separate the island chains as it has been claimed by China. That's the first. And of course, the second, um, even though China could claim the U-shaped line, and for the um, a verdict this morning, it also declined China's claim based on, uh, as it had been analyzed by the verdict, uh, based on the historical right. And of course, the, for the coastal state um, claims, even though China could claim it is a coastal state, but uh, talking about the, the previous precedent entailed in the MPA case, the marine protected areas between Marrakech and Great Britain, even though it seems like um, it, it has been explained, but this kind of um, methodology was not adapted by the court, uh, by the tribunal. Now I'm talking about construction and development. Uh, I would not use land recommendation because it's not a real legal term. Even though this term has been challenged by the tribunals during the hearing last year. And another thing is the term artificial islands is not correctly described. Because I, as I posed a question this morning, what is the difference between reef and rock? 
What if the difference between the artificial constructions on the reef, uh, coral reef, and, the, um, and of course the constructions on the rock, what are the difference? Can they all be described as artificial islands as it has been maintained in the verdict this morning? That's an issue. That's also the question. Another thing is the construction and development activities. Talking about these activities, it has, even though it has been claimed, but the truth is China is a late comer. Comparing to Vietnam and the Philippines, China actually did this kind of uh, activities in the late of, uh, uh, actually in 2014. But of course, everybody is surprised by the economic skill and the speed of the construction. But if you ever have a chance to go to China, you probably find it's not that surprising because the construction ability and, of course, the logistic ability and uh, everything, these are all compatible with China's uh, economic development. And another thing, talking about the environmental issues, then first have been challenged by the, Trump, by the Philippines is the fishery regulation posted by, um, seems to be uh, eliminated by the Hainan, Hainan province. But I figured out that those provisions challenged by Philippines were not true, if I, because I carefully examined those provisions, I figured that's not true. Another thing is the traditional fishing right. Even this kind of a turn, it's not a proper turn, legal turn, ever regulated by the Law of the Sea Convention. Because in, uh, in, in this convention, it seems that it's very hard to distinguish traditional fishing right and historical right, and a historical fishing right. And it has been challenged by the tribunal during the hearing. Another thing is preservation and protection, uh, this kind of uh, claims made by the Philippines. It has to talk about Article 192 and Article 194. Because even though the verdict seems to maintain Article 192 has a general application, all of the cases, but the point is it's very general, general it's too broad, and it cannot be maintained to be a traditional, it can be a, 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 a customary international law, so that can be applied on China. That's the argument that China could have been maintained. Another thing is, uh, in the verdict, it maintained the Article 100 and, uh, 1194, Paragraph 1, Paragraph 5 could be maintained. But the verdict never mentioned Paragraph 2, because Paragraph 2 talk about the transboundary pollution. However, in the Philippines, never pr provide such proof to say it is a, trans a transboundary uh, pollution. So that's my, uh, actually my observation for the verdict this morning. Another thing is the flows in the expert opinions and the evidence. It seems like uh, the, the uh, tribunal actually listen and check the dependent uh, expert evidence. But uh, one of the flows, obvious flows, is nobody ever had the outside investigation on all of these maritime features. So how could those be independent, really independent opinions? I'm talking about as a legal point. Another thing is, uh, even though the species ever uh, presented by the Philippines as an extinction uh, species, but the point is during the hearing, it simply talk about IUCN list, IUCN red list. It ever mentioned about CTAS, which is the conventions to regulate exportation and importation of the species. So that's actually, again, comes to the legal point and the legal flows. Now, I would like to uh, make a conclusion. It seems like, uh, to me, this, um, um, this environmental claims made by the Philippines actually came from the verdict. It's a hardly to be believed to be really an environmental cost. Probably it can be some kind of a political mask. So that's simply my observation. Okay, that's all. I think that was actually 40 seconds early, too. That was, <laughs> or my watch is slow. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> before we throw to the floor, I'm going to uh, steal the prerogative of, of the moderator to ask two quick questions. First of all, uh, John, I recall at a previous appearance you made at CSIS a discussion of which reefs actually were healthy, not to leave us all on, on a note of depression. And you pointed out that the Vietnamese occupied reefs, along with Taiping, are actually doing okay, and the Bruneian EEZ is doing okay. I wonder if you can talk about why that is. Yeah, well, I, I look for signs on satellite imagery that this, uh, this uh, damaging technique for getting giant clams has been carried out, and it's basically these arcs in, 
in water that I happen to know are, are between one and two meters deep. So that's too shallow for dredging. So I look for the marks and uh, the places that are remarkably, uh, where it's markedly absent, where these marks are, are the places where the Vietnamese have military bases. Uh, there's a, one or two where there's some activity, you know, in the south and there's a base up in the north. But generally, the Vietnamese have been protecting their reefs uh, from this particular damaging uh, approach. Now, some of the Philippine bases have damage. Uh, they've been, I was talking to the Marines out on these islands, and they actually had been told to stand down in 2012 because of the this, uh, this, uh, Scarborough Reef incident. They didn't want another one. Uh, but they have protected a few of their reefs, and Malaysia is protecting theirs quite well. Um, Taiping, of course, is doing a superb job, and you see they have to work very hard to do that. However, this doesn't mean that they're not overfished. Uh, Vietnamese uh, reefs, you saw the pictures that um, Xiao showed, those were actually Vietnamese boats in that case, and uh, so they're overfishing as well. But as far as the physical damage to the reefs, um, the Vietnamese, it's a good thing they have a lot of bases. Uh, and, and Dr. Leo, the one thing that, that I'd be curious about that you didn't mention is uh, China's come under significant criticism for a failure to issue environmental impact assessments from its reclamation, despite saying that it has them, uh, and also for failure to give prior notification as required under UNCLOSE to any of the other states. Can you address that? Well, actually, I don't have much information as to the EIA, as you mentioned, which is, seems to be uh, clearly regulated by, two, by Article 206. Uh, but I do have some information as to the uh, environmental pollution, as it had been claimed, um, which is, uh, as I read from and also collected from the um, Foreign Ministry, for, for, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it seems like uh, um, the whole process is the SNAP process, stimulated natural ecological process, as has been claimed, um, declared by the government. And I, I also check out the, the background and I figure out there are at least 60 patents has been applied by those experts. But according to the Chinese patent law, those patent cannot be actually made in public because of the protection area has been claimed. So that's uh, probably the only information I can collect right now at the website. But for the EIA, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the EIA, it's mostly actually has to be regulated by the domestic law, which is contained in the environmental protection law, China. And uh, talking about the domestic law, if he's uh, talking about this, then it's uh, actually the EIA, one of the big, biggest problems is how to collect the public opinion. Now think about those remote merchant features. I don't think it's uh, quite visible right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, we'll throw it open to the floor, and I think I'll follow the, the pattern that's been set and take a few questions and then throw them to the panel. So, start over here. I'll go ahead and speak without the... Uh Microphone. Uh, James Borton, I'm an environmental policy writer and independent researcher, and in fact I just returned from uh, two islands off Vietnam's central coast, Kula Cham, which is indeed a successful marine protected area, and Lison Island. But let me just begin in terms of framing a question for all the panelists. I, I want to applaud uh, CSIS for having this very important environmental security panel, or if you wish, uh, uh, ecological, political um, dialogue. Let's be clear that uh, environmental degradation is a central issue in the reinterpretation and redefinition of security. And so the question I have for any of the panelists today uh, is, one, your definition or response to the idea of science diplomacy actually uh, entering this kind of national or international conversation and the timeliness, uh, today's uh, arbitration hearing, for science to really raise its head and more importantly for uh, each of you to have a major voice in perhaps bringing some peace building effort and uh, confidence building mechanisms through science diplomacy. If you could respond to that, I think that would be uh, helpful for all of us. Thank you. Thanks, John. We had another at the next table in front. Right 
I'm Linda Yar at George Washington University, and like the previous questioner, I'd like to congratulate CSIS on this extraordinary, um, on raising this topic on this panel. Um, one of the areas in, of strong cooperation between the China and the United States has been on climate change. And in the previous panel, the term capacity building seemed to uh, refer to hardware. But like the previous questioner, I think that capacity building should really be related to uh, developing awareness on climate change, developing awareness and the ability for, tra for training on negotiation and diplomacy around issues where we can get together and uh, particularly as climate change is a huge factor in terms of the, the mobility of fisheries, the security of naval forces and installations in the whole area. So um, thank you for this panel and where do you see the opportunities for uh, cooperation on climate change impacting security for the South China Sea. And we'll take one more, in the middle. I'm Charmaine de Agracias of East West Center. Um, to, um, for the Taiwanese uh, scholar. Sir, um, the fisheries agreement between the Philippines and Taiwan in the northern tip of the Philippines, um, how is that? Has that um, helped at all? And could that be a model for Scarborough Shoal, perhaps, between China and the Philippines? I'm referring to the fisheries agreement that was just signed last year, if that at all has helped in the illegal fishing activities. And also, um, I'd like to ask whether, can there still be a case against China on, uh, <laughs> on the damage that they have done in the South China Sea? And um, to what UN body should that be directed to? And is this like um, a state party case? Uh, how, how should this figure? All right, we'll just go down the line, take the questions as you choose. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, on science and diplomacy, I, I'd like to thank James Borton for bringing this up. Actually, James Borton has been a, a major advocate for the Spratly Islands Peace Park over the last uh, couple of years. And um, actually, science is, is a very important part of moving towards some kind of peaceful solution. Um, when people ask me, well, how much support is there for you know, something like the Peace Park or, or for joint management around the region? Well, I don't know any scientists around the region who don't support it. And I know lots of scientists around the region, including in, in uh, mainland China, Taiwan, Vietnam, and so forth. And so there is a very strong agreement that what we've been discussing is indeed the case and there has to be some action we're ex we're facing a fisheries collapse already in uh, 2000 it was shown that the, the major uh, pelagic fish species had dropped by 50 percent uh, over the the previous couple of decades and now it's another decade and a half left and I'm afraid to look uh, but uh, both uh, Ed Gomez and, and Xiao have been leading efforts uh, throughout Southeast Asia to strengthen this, uh, this strong network we have of scientists. And, and hopefully that will uh, lead to something. I think one of the uh, problems with science diplomacy is there are not enough scientists in the region, especially marine scientists. And, um, there have been some initiatives in the past. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, Pahashim Jalal of Indonesia that um, sort of uh, started the, uh, uh, tr I think, the track two initiatives for managing the potential conflicts in the South China Sea. Uh, but these have uh, not gone uh, too far because of the resistance from the um, uh, uh, major country involved that... Um, uh, no. So nothing much has happened on the in, in, in that initiative anyway in terms of the environmental front. Um, <clears throat> the um, uh, uh, issue about, uh, well, there's a point about climate change. Uh, there haven't been very much uh, studies in, in this uh, region uh, simply because of um, uh, inaccessibility of uh, the area to, to scientists. 
I, I think in, in previous sessions there has been mention about the harassment of uh, uh, research vessels by um, uh, Chinese authorities. So it's, it's, not, it's not very easy to conduct marine scientific research in the South China Sea without being harassed. Thank you. Professor Shell. <laughs> As to the, uh, the conflict of the fishing activity actually sometimes happens between Taiwan and the Philippines and all Japan and also in the mainland China. So, but, so to, I think our government, you know, it always will happen when it is the economical easy zone, they are overlapping, you know. So, so I think that we need to negotiate, you know, bilaterally too. So we, I think we have a very good example in the resort. I remember a couple of years ago for the Batan, that, that the area, the Taiwan, Taiwan fishermen got uh, gone down by the uh, Philippine uh, soldiers. And then the, uh, we got some, uh, you know, kind of negotiation on that. So, and also in the Diao Yu Tai, and as well as at the, uh, the Okino Shima, some, uh, you know, small uh, reefs, uh, that belong to Japan, we also have that problem happens. The government, they also negotiate with them, we have some good result. But to the China mainland side, it's sometimes difficult, you know, because they always come uh, to sometimes invade to the all territory waters, but the uh, well, Coast Guard has no good capacity, you know, to enough manpower and, and uh, vessel to expel them. So that's the problem. We are still hope to uh, talk with the men in China. That's my answer, thanks. Dr. Uh, for the first question, scientific uh, diplomacy, I totally agree with this idea. Um, well, the point is, uh, for the, sun, the, the good example would be the Arctic and Antarctic, this region. Uh, but it seems like the, one of the differences is how to build up the trust and how to build up the coordination and cooperation among the stakeholders. In the Arctic region, it seems like uh, it's, uh, it's quite easy and peace-going, uh, especially those countries involved. They can reach the agreement because they trust each other. And um, for the Antarctic, it seems like uh, there is already a treaty to frozen um, the, the sovereignty, so that uh, it seems like uh, it's quite a no, it's really no problem in those two regions. But in terms of the South China Sea, it's talking about the legal aspect, that's a, a little bit different scenario. Because for those two polar regions, they could be um, regarded as a, some kind of common heritage or common property of humankind. But what about South China Sea? So that's the, probably the legal issue that people have to come across. And as to the fishery issues they mentioned, from the Philippines, I'm not so sure. Um, for this part, I, I, I yes, they, I, I do, I'm, I'm quite uh, optimistic as to this issue, because uh, for the new president, I do believe there will be more opportunities to talk, to sit down and to talk, and to set aside the dispute. But the point is, uh, there used to be some bad example, like the 2005. There used to be a earthquake agreement between between Philippines, Vietnam, and China. But later on, there are more and more outside voices getting involved, and finally it was failed. So I, I think the scientists probably will be disappointed on this aspect. So as long as the less involvement of the outside power, there will be more agreement and more opportunities to talk among the scientists. Thank you. I'd just add on the uh, Philippine-Taiwan fishing agreement, um, my understanding is that much like the Taiwan-Japan fishing agreement in, in the East China Sea, the devil is in the implementation. Um, the hardest part is getting fishermen to abide by it. It's easy to tell your Coast Guard not to go in Region X or Region Y uh, and then tell them, well, if you run into somebody else's fishermen, don't harass them. But when those fishermen go farther than they're supposed to or engage in activities they're not supposed to, uh, that's where the difficulty comes in. And the agreement's been, what, six months old or so. Uh, I expect that we won't have any idea if it's having an effect for another several years. Uh, let's take one more round of questions. Right up front here. Thank you. Um, we were, the scientists presented us the, what happened to the coral reefs and the, the economy regarding that. How, how do you explain to a ninth grader 
the logic of building these artificial islands and in the uh, and as a consequence the coral reefs were damaged so how how can you explain that to a ninth grader the logic behind all this construction okay no our friend here Hi, Julia Street again. Uh, I have a question. I, I think this is a really important topic, particularly in the context of South China Sea. And uh, this is uh, something we think politically is a low sensitivity area. Maybe it's uh, one of the options we can develop something for further collaboration. And um, I understand there are so many research uh, projects conducted for the uh, Coral Triangle. And I'm wondering uh, how is the situation, uh, in addition to the uh, island construction activities, like um, the pollution or the damage to the corals, like uh, pollution or uh, I mean other human activities, and then also the climate change induced impact on the corals. And, uh, I think there is uh, because uh, some, something like the water, uh, the sea, the ocean water acidification and the bleaching of corals. So, how is the situation like that, for the, particularly for the scientists from this area? And then, do you see any kind of uh, really the um, the impact on the regional people? And uh, are there awareness from the, I mean, the bottom up? and probably to reach up to the political agenda. I mean, probably that's too difficult, but just how you feel about overall kind of situation. And, and if you can elaborate a bit more on that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Another? Uh, Scott? Hi, Scott Cheney Peters, uh, State Department. Um, given that the uh, ruling uh, further diminished the amount of uh, national jurisdiction uh, covered uh, by the, uh, the islands, um, would you imagine that something like the Peace Park would be uh, imbued with a regional fisheries management organization as opposed to a traditional uh, marine protected area as uh, they've traditionally been within the zones of, a, uh, of national jurisdiction? All right, let's do the same thing again. I think if we go relatively quickly, there's at least three more hands so we can get in another round. Okay, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll talk about the Peace Park. Um, the, the, when you look at the history of how the Antarctic Peace Park was put together, um, you, you'll hear a lot of people respond, oh, it's not the same situation, there's differences here, differences there. But I have never seen anything that convinced me that you couldn't follow basically the same procedure. Uh, hopefully, though, instead of waiting a couple of decades before you put in better environmental controls, you'd put that in at the beginning. That would be a difference. But, the, you know, it, it, was, it was in that case arranged by Eisenhower. They had representatives from all these countries. They actually secretly got together and, and came up with this, this brilliant treaty. And uh, I don't see any reason why that couldn't happen again. It would result in organizations, as there are Antarctic treaty organizations, um, and it, you would, then that would include uh, panels that, that understand the fishery situation and the environment. Another issue might be if someone would like to claim that the state has to take responsibility, that it has to be actually in some sense to indicate the sovereignty and of course similar to ownership of this maritime entitlement. So I just stop here for these two questions. All right, um, <clears throat> sand is falling through the hourglass here. We have five minutes, so I'm only gonna take two more questions and then ask the panelists to do a little lightning round for us. So first I have Mike McDevitt up front. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to make an observation about the collapse, potential collapse of fishing in the South China Sea. There's been some interesting work done uh, by scholars at RSIS in Singapore. Uh, the fishing issue, as far as China is concerned, is caught up uh, in their quest for food security, I think is the term of art used in China. Uh, and related to that is the desire to increase the protein content uh, in the diet of uh, average Chinese. Um, and over 50% of the, in, of, of the world's fish that are either caught or farmed are consumed in China. Um, every year. Uh, and so what's happened is China's fisheries in its territorial seas and in, in close by those territorial seas are already fished out. 
uh, and the fish farms uh, off the coast of China are now very polluted. I think many Americans are aware of that. They won't buy, they're trying not to uh, buy fish that are raised in China. But essentially they're polluted. And so my understanding is the Spratly area is, is where the government of China has placed a lot of bets for the future to be able to keep the fish supplies coming to deal with the food security issue. And one of the concepts that they have in mind is what is called open seas fish farming. And the intent was to do open seas fish farming in the Spratlys. So the question for our distinguished panel is, one, is it possible to do open seas fish farming? And two, if it is possible, are there environmental dangers in the Spratlys if, you, if uh, Beijing should pursue this course of action? We have one more. Jeffrey. Hi, thank you. Um, for the first two panelists, uh, why have we not seen environmental NGOs like Greenpeace or WWF uh, take up the information that you presented, which is very striking and kind of emotional graphic images and so on, um, and what might be done to encourage uh, civil society to take an interest in the South China Sea. Thank you. All right, and now I'm going to ask the impossible. If uh, our panelists can give maybe a minute answer and any closing thoughts. Okay, with regard to uh, China's efforts on fish farming, what we see in satellite imagery are in protected lagoons where where 98 percent of the wave energy has already been dispersed by that outer crest. We are seeing uh, fish cages. Uh, especially Mischief Reef. They actually had to move it when they started building because they were going to kill all their fish. I think they did anyways. Um, but but uh, offshore, fishing, uh, offshore fish farming is possible. Uh, there's a lot of work actually done at the University of Miami on this, and Japan is leading the world in some of this technology. Uh, it's very expensive, but you don't have to go to the Spratleys to do it. You can do it in any place that has fairly clear water. As far as their efforts, you know, the idea that that's where we're going to get fish in the future uh, in terms of actual fishing, um, the one thing you would not want to do is start destroying the fish production machines, and that's what's going on. With regard to the environmental NGOs, I know Ed has written about this. I've complained about this. I've talked to a number of them, and the word fear comes up. <laughs> it's got to do with any big NGO, and we call those bingos, uh, big international NGOs. The, the bingos generally have big projects in China, and so they just stay out of this. However, um, uh, within those activities, uh, the TNC is starting to move into um, uh, the giant clam issue in Hainan. But I was approached after a couple weeks ago, we had a, a meeting in, in, uh, on the International uh, Society, uh, Coral Reef Symposium, and three of the Chinese uh, scientists came up afterwards and says, oh, by the way, we talked to our local officials and they're going to stop the giant clam fishing. They're going to allow the people to get rid of what's in the warehouses, but they asked that we, we stigmatize owning giant clams the way we have tigers and elephant products. Any of you try to buy a tiger or elephant product, you're going to be, you know, ostracized. <laughs> but if you buy a piece of a clam, you know. So we have to get this idea out that owning giant clam products is a terrible thing, and that will help those people locally. And they're doing this without the bingos, and they're going directly to the local government. Yeah. I, that. Um article I wrote a little over a year ago in, in our uh, most popular broadsheet in the Philippines uh, brought that up. Uh, apparently, um, both World Wildlife Fund and uh, Conservation International were approached by some uh, concerns uh, uh, individuals in, uh, in the Philippines uh, to do something about, uh, or at least protest, uh, the island building activities. But uh, they were just, I mean, this uh, individual was just turned away. I think um, uh, John uh, brought it out that um, the, they get, the, the, the big NGOs, bingos, get a lot of money from, from Chinese uh, sources, so they don't want to um, uh, bite the hand that feeds them. Um, the, um, 
well, I think the fish farming thing has been, uh, has been addressed. So um, uh, I, I can't remember if anything else you want me to address. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the fishery issue, I'm not an expert of food security, but of course I, I can provide some information as to the updated inf um, law innovation in China. There are at least some of those um, laws concerning marine environment, uh, marine living resources can be noticed. For example, the wildlife animal law has been revised, and next year in January it will be coming into force. So in this sense, more and more wild species, wildlife species will be protected with very high and strict standard. And that's the reason probably uh, you will see the uh, fishermen in the time when they have will be under very strict construction, uh, restriction in the future. Another one, another two will be the fishery law and another one will be marine environmental law. Those will be subject to be revised in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are two minutes over, which by DC conference standards means we're early. Um, thank you all for a very long day. I want to remind everybody that while this is the official end of the South China Sea Conference, uh, our colleagues in the China Power Project run by Bonnie Glazer will have Ambassador Sui Tian Kai here uh, in this very room in 15 minutes to discuss China's reaction to the case. So feel free to stick around or come back as you choose.